it's very difficult for me to make videos like this on a day like today and say we should be short, we should be shorting this market that has had such an aggressive run and is performing so solidly well. One of the best first halves ever that so far in the second half has continued. So I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to tell you that I actually have very little short exposure right now. I do have some. I'm not completely not exposed to the downside, but I'm along areas of the market that I think I'm at, are actually comfortably priced. And while I'm, I've obviously learned a lot of lessons about short selling this year and Stanley Druckenmiller said when he was working for George Soros that he shorted $200 million worth of stock. It went up to $600 million that he owed. And then those companies later went bankrupt. I have similarly learned my fair share of shorting lessons this year. And it goes beyond that as a general philosophy. But I'm not, definitely not, definitely, definitely not going in to this market. As a matter of fact, I think the areas that are actually attractively priced are very few and far between. And I think the vast majority of the market is very expensive and earnings are declining. And I expect earnings to continue to decline. So I think they are expensive based on trailing earnings. But I think forward earnings are, as this quarter estimates continue to expect, they're going to decline. And I'm not so optimistic about the rest of the year in terms of earnings growth or anything like that. So you look at a lot of these large companies, Apple is at a roughly $3 trillion market cap. It had this market cap for about one or two days at the all-time high, our previous all-time high in January 2022. That was a time when Apple was experiencing double-digit earnings growth, earnings higher than it is today, and there was a notion that was very prevalent and was one of our initial main arguments for avoiding this sector and believing this sector was overpriced, don't forget, Apple is roughly 50% at a 50% higher multiple than it was pre-COVID when it was all, it's been the biggest company in the world since like 2014. So the argument that, oh, now people are starting to appreciate Apple. No, that's, that's not it. That ain't it, in my opinion. Anyways, there was a Tina trade. What does Tina mean? Tina means there is no alternative. What was Tina? For the past many decades, uh, financial advisors, hedge funds, etc., have focused on both stocks and bonds. Stocks and bonds in their investment portfolios. But since COVID, since rates went low, we all know about low mortgage rates, all that, Bonds were simply not attractive investments, particularly when people felt the Fed was printing a lot of money and inflation might come. It did end up coming later. So as a safe haven investment, Microsoft, Apple, etc. were receiving the benefit of Tina. Not only were interest rates low, impacting valuations for stocks and lower than they are today, despite prices and multiples being in some cases, higher than they are were then. Not only were lower rates helping the multiples then, and not necessarily now, but rates were so low that there was no alternative. So people who were looking for safer investments couldn't simply couldn't get a safe investment out of a bond because of the notion that Inflation could happen. The Fed was printing money and the interest rates were so low. You know, you have opportunity risk. You have currency risk. You have various risks associated with that investment alone. And then you price in or add interest rate risk and low interest rates. You've got a serious dilemma on your hands. So the biggest stocks in the market, Apple, Microsoft, they don't have the growth rates they used to have. They don't have the TINA benefit. They don't have the low interest rate benefit, but they're more expensive now. 
for that reason, and that is very similar to very other areas of the market. One of the highest ever multiples, we're now roughly in line or higher than that. I find it not a compelling situation, not an investment I could buy and just feel comfortable holding. Conversely, I look at energy stocks, trading at single digit multiples with big dividends, with oil prices that have been suppressed via artificial supply, which is now coming offline, demand that has remained robust and continue, is expected to continue to grow, and supply cuts. That is an area I can comfortably go long, and I can sit in and not fret, not worry at all. So I'm heavily long energy, and I think that's a great place to be. I think it's one of the few places in this market that I can comfortably sit and be patient because right now I think we have to be patient. Yes, the market is obviously deliver is delivering tremendous gains in a tremendously short period of time and it sucks not to participate in that because I have I'm not always a Debbie Downer. I'm not a short only person, okay? I've actually spent most more time being long than short and I have outperformed in those long periods by quite good margins. But I can do that when I feel stocks are well-priced. And I don't feel that now. And I don't think earnings have troughed. And I don't feel like the economy is done slowing down. So I'm not... <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I have learned a lot of lessons about being short. And I'm not advocating going short and shorting this market and exposing yourself to that kind of risk. I am saying that I do think stocks are very expensive. And... I'm fine not participating in that side of the market. I'm going to stick to my energy names. And there's a few, very few, small venture capital-like companies that I am happy to invest in that are now at attractive valuations and haven't been you know, up 50% or so year to date. So I'm happy with a few of those. Not suggesting going too crazy on that though. They're still high risk. And like I said, I, I overall don't think the Fed is done. I don't think they're about to pivot. I don't think they're, you know, we heard today, like they're, they're not declaring anything. And the market is obviously declaring something. The market's going to move ahead of time, but the, there's more pain to come in the economy. That I feel, I feel very confident about that. So whether or not it's a full on deep recession or something like that, you know, obviously we've all been, or some of us have been humbled by our ability to expect that, um, you know, Q1 or Q2 rather was obviously a period of growth, not recession, or most likely a period of growth and not recession. But I think it's definitely slower growth compared to Q1. And I think Q3 is going to be even slower growth. And I think Q4 is going to be even slower growth than that. Q1 next year is going to be hard to say, but I don't expect the Fed to be cutting. I don't expect fiscal stimulus to be coming in any sort of major way. Um, I expect unemployment to continue to tick up slightly. I expect student loans to suppress a lot of spending. I expect credit to continue to uh, become less available. So I think a lot of economic forces that are going to weigh on earnings are there and are worth paying attention to and the time to buy stocks at extremely high prices is not now in my opinion so that's my read on the market that is how a short seller like me for this year so far after a tremendous year last year is viewing this market that's where i'm positioned and that's how i'm adapting at this point in time so that's today's video until next time peace out